welcome into another new episode of the That Movie Is Ours Now podcast. My name is David Sugarman. If you're coming back, thanks so much for stopping by again. And if it's your first time here, it's really nice to meet you. Uh, like, rate, review, subscribe, all of that good stuff. If you enjoy the podcast, it helps it grow. Hopefully uh, other new people will find it. As I record this, it is day 135 of the writer's strike, and that is what today's episode is all about as we speak with Rob Foreman. He is first and foremost a writer, uh, but he is a strike captain, a unit lock coordinator. I will let him explain of what all of that means. He is also a co-chair of the LGBTQ plus writers committee. So Rob wears a whole lot of hats and is a writer on strike right now and we dive all the way in on how things have changed um, in many ways since May 2nd when the writer's strike started, um, some of the tactics that the studios have been using to deter the strikes and um, just really dive in on a little bit of, of what life is like as a writer and why this strike, why this fight is so important for the WGA. Uh, Rob also will list a few different places that if you have a few bucks to spare um, are good places to donate to to help out the writers um, and actors as well on strike. Uh, I will leave those links in the description below this episode. Uh, it's the Entertainment Community Fund, the Green Envelope Grocery uh, and Aid Fund, and uh, Humanity. Excuse me, Humanitas, uh, I think I'm saying that right, has a also a, a grocery aid fund for, for writers. So I'll leave links to all those in the description below, and Rob will go into more detail um, about what those specific places do. Um, great conversation. Um, I really admire Rob and, and, and all that he is, he is doing and rooting for him so hard and the rest of the WGA, SAG-AFTRA, uh, all of the all the different unions and members on strike because they want a fair shake to make the things that you and I all love, movies and TV shows and on down the line, video games even, um, as, as Rob is, is, also, is also written on video games. So um, it extends to more portions of the field than you or I might even realize. So let's get into it. This is That Movie Is Ours Now, episode 12 with Rob Foreman. And here he is, Rob Foreman. Rob, thanks so much for joining the That Movie Is Ours Now podcast today. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let, let, let's get right into it. If, if my day calculator is, is right um, as we record this, it's day. And I think it sounds like you had a dog or something nearby. Oh, yeah. No, I have two rescue dogs and uh, they just scampered <laughs> off. Uh, the, my, uh, my husband, their, uh, their other dad is uh, out of the house right now. So you're, just... you're already, you're already, you're already, you're already ticking boxes. <laughs> the fact that you not just have two dogs, but two rescue dogs. Um, let's yeah. try, I'll try and get back on topic. I always get distracted when there's a dog in the room. <laughs> Within 15 seconds of the pod start. <laughs> <laughs> my, my fault. <laughs> uh, but uh, as as we start this, it's day 134 uh, of the writer's strike, day 60 um, of, of the actor's strike. From Let's start with the writer's strike, um, since that's what you're mainly involved in. From May 2nd to now, is there any significant difference in your mind of, of where the Writers Guild is at in, in terms of coming to a fair... Um, an equitable deal and and what you what your guild wants and and ultimately deserves. Do you feel any closer than you do in since May second? Yeah, I think we do feel closer. I, I think we also feel a lot closer to each other. Um, and I think that has helped us feel like we are closer to a deal. Um, you know, there there's been within the last month uh, from when we were recording this, there's been a lot of uh, hemming and hawing and. Uh, are they negotiating? Is the first counter offer that the AMPTP studios, that's the Alliance of Motion uh, Picture and Television Producers, um, is the first counter offer that they gave the Writers Guild in 102 days, uh, is that their first and final offer? Mm -hmm. uh, it's never their final offer. Um, but the fact that uh, they moved on some core issues, not far enough in uh, our point of view, and not on enough of our core issues that really affect uh, so many different sectors of Writers Guild membership um, and all the different kinds of writing that is uh, covered under the WGA now. Um, 
you know, uh, we we of course we feel closer. Um, we're just waiting on the studios to figure out that we are going to be picketing until they cover all of the sectors that we're talking about. Um, we've been very clear that we don't expect them to give us 100% of everything that we asked for, but we basically told them, and this is, this is from my point of view as a member and a captain, uh, not as someone in the negotiating committee, because I am not, so I can't speak to the literal language of what has been in the negotiating room, but uh, we've been consistent in telling them that there are huge existential threats facing so many different forms of having a writing career in television and in film. Um, and we are on strike now and they all need to be addressed. Again, like the solutions we proposed is not necessarily the solution, but the answer cannot be no. Um, and it's something that you develop in a writer's room. You know, you throw a pitch out and maybe it's not the thing that gets in the show, but maybe it leads to the thing that is. Um, so that that's the attitude that I think uh, a lot of writers are bringing to it. Um, and we are waiting for the studios to catch up. Um, so, yeah. What is day to day like in terms of, um, well, let's start, let's start with, with your role as captain and a, a unit lock coordinator. I imagine that's an important role, but I have no idea what it is. So tell me about what, <laughs> what your specific role um, within the Writers Guild and, 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 and within this strike is currently. Yeah, so within the Writers Guild, I'm a member. Um, I've been a member since 2012. Uh, I started my career on support staff and was lucky back in the days of um, basic cable scripted shows um, that I was. I finally found myself on a show called Army Wives on Lifetime that uh, mm -hmm. got renewed when I was there because everything else that I worked on had been canceled after anywhere between 10 to 2 episodes. Um, it got renewed. I had a chance to write a freelance script. It went well. And for the next season, uh, what turned out to be the final season of that show, I got staffed as a full-time writer. Um, and that's kind of how the latter used to work. Uh, one of the ways that it used to work was there was a spirit of mentorship and you would uh, essentially pay your dues in support staff and learn the show and have a chance to prove yourself and your skills. Um, so I was able to join the guild in 2012, and uh, I've been a captain since 2014. Uh, the captain system that we use uh, is not only active during strikes, it's uh, to keep members informed about uh, anything that the guild wants members to know. Um, you know, uh, whether we're putting out a survey to say, hey, what are you feeling in your career? What is not reflected in the data that we're already seeing um, so that we can prepare for our next negotiating cycle? Um, there's a lot of that. And there's also a lot of kind of being an intermediary between uh, the members of my team and the board of directors. Um, so it's both a top down and a bottom up uh, system. Um, during the strike, uh, as a lot coordinator, um, I'm one of a few people who are essentially in charge of our picket line at Universal Studios. Um, uh, which uh, <laughs> has been a little infamous during the strike for uh, hashtag Treegate, where uh, the studio um, trimmed some trees illegally uh, over where picketers were picketing during the height of summer um, and uh, potentially killed those trees. Uh, uh, but we'll, we'll hopefully not. We'll find out. Um, <laughs> but uh, stay tuned next time. Uh, <laughs> um, so they, that happened and it was just like very strange, um, to deal they, with. I'm sorry to interrupt. They did this just to disrupt the, 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 your strike, so to speak, or, or to take away a shady area in the, in, in some, what, what was the idea I'm not, behind I'm this? not going to ascribe intention, but the effect of it was certainly to take away shade during the middle of summer in the Valley in Los Angeles. Hmm. Uh, so, you know. Uh, whether it's what they intended to do or not, the effect of it was all of a sudden our picketers uh, did not have shade cover. Um, and uh, there was kind of a media firestorm over it. And the studio basically has now been providing pop-up tents uh, to provide some shade. 
um, which is nice, but like the trees were beautiful and now they have a really ugly haircut. Um, and uh, amid all of that, they also, this particular studio also tore up all of the sidewalks between the gates and uh, literally starting on week two of the strike, um, we lost sidewalks between five different gates that picketers have to be at in order to create a legal picket line. Um, and uh, they claimed it was all permitted and part of a multi-year construction project and construction is going on right now, but we are, I've even lost count of how many weeks into the strike, you know, you said 134 days, it's a lot of weeks and this started on week mm -hmm. two uh, and we do not have sidewalks back um, between most of these gates. Um, so they are uh, tough to get to for pedestrians and it's uh, become a little bit of a safety hazard. Um, so all of those things are things that I never expected to deal with as a writer, but I have now brushed up on tree law and, uh, the permitting system in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> and, uh, outside of that, this was a long rambly answer. I, I apologize, but outside of Absolutely that. Absolutely not. Know, don't, don't. It's, 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 the, it's not funny. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like, and that's, that, that's so much of, um, you know, so much of this strike, like people are smiling, people are laughing. And um, it's because the whole situation is ridiculous, not because it's actually funny. Um, uh, you know, we try and bring, that's another role of being a law coordinator is to just try and bring some joy to what is a very grindy and tough proceeding, you know, being out of work uh, for those who were working immediately prior to the strike, you know, um, for those people, it's we're in month five for people whose careers were affected by all of the systemic stuff that we're trying to change with this strike. They've been out of work for longer. Um, and everybody sees, you know, the goal at the end of never is going to be easy to do this career, but there are things about it that uh, used to make a sustainable living that over the course of the last decade, as particularly as streaming and big tech entered the entertainment space, um, the norms that used to be expected for how long one would work or uh, how many writers might be in a room, or does a feature writer have a guarantee at doing a rewrite of their own work? Um, there's a lot of stuff that, again, like was just understood and a norm that uh, now we feel we have to codify into our contract because the studios said, well, we don't have to do it. You know, like it, it, it's not it's not in the contract. So mm -hmm. why would we hire more than one writer if that one writer wants to do it all themselves you know um and it just hurts the ecosystem of the entire industry um when artists are not uh being paid fairly uh not being valued for their time and their contributions to these massive companies you know the asks that the writers guild ultimately uh, wants out of these negotiations, if we got everything that we wanted would be less than 2% of these companies' profits, not even their revenues, less than 2% of their profits. It's just about artists um, being able to share in the fruits of their labor. We're not trying to put these companies out of business. It seems like the CEOs are trying to put their companies out of business because they have kept workers out of work for four months and now no product is being made. Uh, <laughs> you know, you look at their, uh, their financial disclosures to Wall Street, to their investors, and, um, you know, it's just Warner Brothers in one quarter lost 300 to $500 million. Um, and that was in a quarter that Barbie existed, their biggest movie. Um, and it's because, um, I believe I have that right. Uh, uh, it made a lot and, of and money. It, it made a lot of money. Um, but uh, it, it, it's because they're, they may have stopped spending money on making things, but they're not making money the way that mm -hmm. they could be if they just decided, hey, our workers are worth it. You know, um, the writers, the actors, 
IATSE, the Teamsters, you know, all of the major unions in town uh, that are going to negotiate with these studios after the Writers Guild gets a deal, which we will. Um, you know, everyone is just fighting for a way of life. And unfortunately, it feels like the consortium of studios are just fighting for a dollar, you know, and that's why we're going to win. Hell yeah to all that. Um, but my, my next question would be, I guess, you know, this is now, like you said, been going on for a lot of weeks. Uh, by the time I post this, it'll be close to 140 days for the writer's strike, you know, closing in on 100 for the actors. How especially, you know, there's, uh, there's been a lot of misconception of, well, if they're in Hollywood and they're a writer and actor, they're a millionaire. And of course, mm -hmm. I'm sure you are frustrated by a lot of that talk because you know that's not the case. And so as many of just people are trying to break into the middle class, how is morale, so to speak? And how do you keep morale high this deep in when people are, you know, now really, you know, maybe they didn't have a lot of savings and, 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 you know, maybe they don't have another skill or another job to fall back on or family money. How, how are things in, in that department this, this deep into the strike? I'm sure that's a worry. Yeah, you know, and I think that that it, it's a it's a key thing that what we don't want to happen for the entertainment industry is it is for it to only be available to people who come from money, who have a support system, um, uh, who can weather financial storms like a five month strike. You know, um, there are not a there are not many people that can um, be out of work for five months without you know, tightening their belt and, um, you know, uh, seeking financial aid in so many different ways that the industry really has come together to provide as much as it can. Um, it's not the same as drawing a paycheck. Um, and yeah, I, I see it on the line every day, particularly in the last couple of weeks is people are resolved, uh, but they are financially hurting. You know, and they can't they can't not feel that because those financial worries do bleed into every aspect of your life. Um, I definitely know people who <laughs> uh, come to the picket line because there's often free donated food and that means they don't have to pay for lunch, you know, um, and it's uh, it is really this. uh sad misconception that everyone it, it, it's weird because either everyone in hollywood is a millionaire or everyone in hollywood is trying to make it you know and th those are kind of the two misconceptions about this industry and both of them are true and neither of them are true at the same time um a lot of people are just people who love television and movies and want to tell stories in that world or be part of the art departments or, you know, act or direct or be a costumer and editor, um, all of the crafts that go into creating the things that give people joy or make them feel something when they watch it. Um, you have to be really passionate about what, this is uh in order to do it because it's really hard even when even when the strike is not on so you know as far as morale earlier in the strike i think there were a lot of these theme events and we still do those um you know 130 something days into the strike there are some repeats uh there's a little bit of like are we are we you know at the bottom of the barrel like figuring out like what's this thing that we're going to do on wednesday of next week um, but, uh, that's also something where, uh, I find the endless creativity of different picketers, um, just so inspiring because they'll bring something to me as a lot coordinator and say, Hey, can we do this here? And, uh, it's something that I would never think of. And again, that's why it, it, this is a television thing. Uh, that's why it's so important to have multiple people in a writer's room because there are so many different perspectives and ideas out there and you just have to be open to hearing them. Um, There's a, a lot, especially if you're just, if you're not involved in, in the strikes in any way directly or in the industry and you're just trying to keep up like myself um, and a lot of just other people who love movies and TV, there's a lot being thrown at you and it's kind of hard to, to sort of 
get through the BS and, and yeah. what's important and what's not and what's real and what's not. What do you think is one issue uh, that maybe hasn't been talked about enough and hasn't cut through the way maybe like AI or chat GPT has that's just as important that maybe it's just not as sexy as an issue for some reason, but what, what's an issue that you want people to know that you're fighting for that it hasn't been talked about enough? Yeah. You know, I think that AI really took a lot of the oxygen in the first, let's call it, let's call it the first three months of the strike. Um, and then the actors went on strike and they have their own um, deep present fears about mm. AI taking their jobs. Um, so it, it, it's clearly an issue that like needs to be worked out, um, needs guardrails, um, because I, I think, you know, if you can replace an actor with AI, uh, at the end of the day, like, why do you need anyone on a crew? And then everyone is out of a job. So, uh, it, it, like, just because it's had a lot of oxygen, like, it's still like a really important thing to get right. But, um something that I think really hasn't been talked about a ton is the screenwriter issues. Um, and, you know, the, the for feature films, the percentage of the membership of the WGA that used to be, um, or the percentage of WGA members who were feature film writers primarily used to be a lot higher than it is now. Now, you know, TV has exploded. We've been through peak TV. There are five, 700 scripted shows on, uh, you know, at least when they're able to start filming again. Um, and so there is a lot more television membership in the Writers Guild now. Um, I happen to be a crossover writer where right before the strike, I was doing my first studio feature um, and had dabbled in in the area before. And uh, it, it is really, I think it is the it, one of the major ignored issues. And um, I think when we saw the studio's counter, and I'll get into kind of the core of what it is, it was something that um, paid lip service to the problem while creating a giant loophole. And that's why that that's why their counter offer from about a month ago at this point was not good enough. And the membership would have voted it down because we've all been on the picket line for now five months and we've all shared stories about what is weird and wrong in our career and the ways where writers are being exploited and not paid um, when they're being told to do work. And so the feature film version of that uh, is kind of twofold. Um, and basically when you sell something or, you know, sell a pitch, um, you have different steps in your contract. And a step is just like, here's a piece of writing, your first draft, a rewrite, another rewrite, another rewrite, a polish, um, which is just supposed to be like a tiny little rewrite at the end. Um, and they're all, it all used, it used to be understood, like this is a collaborative effort, you know, the process is I write something, someone has an opinion, I rewrite. Like it's mm -hmm. just, no one expects their first draft to be filmed word for word. Um, so it's baked into the cake. Over the course of the last 10 years or so, we saw that the standard in contracts was that the first draft was a guarantee obviously you sell it, you are guaranteed to be paid for the first thing you write. And everything was optional after that. And it didn't used to be that way. You used to be guaranteed a relationship with your creative executive and with the studio that was buying your work, um, which meant they would trust you um, and meant it was more of a conversation. Those rewrites are still happening, but they are now for free because they will hold over the payment until you do to three, four, I've heard horror stories in like the dozens of rewrites. Um, and it all just counts as one. And it's because there's no guarantee of another. So you're just going to do the work until they're, they're happy. And that isn't the way that it should be, but that is how the contracts have degraded. And so there's two tools that the Writers Guild has proposed in order to fix this. One is just a flat guarantee of a rewrite payment, period. Like anyone who sells a feature film 
you are guaranteed the payment for the first draft and you are guaranteed a payment for a rewrite. And hopefully that would cut down on the amount of free work. The other proposal is though, um, and this, this is one that I think is actually like more substantial and gets to potentially a class issue is um, the way that people are paid for feature film work is you get paid a little bit of some of the money when you're told to go right. And then you're, you get paid the rest of it when you send the draft in and they accept it. And again, that's kind of where the problem has been in them saying, we accept this. No, go do more rewrites and then we'll accept it. Um, so the proposal is writers get paid by the week. And in a feature contract, there's a number of weeks that are written, in, written into it. So you can do it essentially for a net zero to the cost to the studio, but it allows the writer to have a regular paycheck after they have signed a deal mm. uh, to say, pay bills, pay a mortgage, pay down student loans, <laughs> pay, all, pay, pay all the things that people need to, to live in life mm -hmm. and also have a little bit more power so that they're not forced to do all of these free rewrites because that second payment is being held over their heads. If the payment, if the money is coming in every week based on what they've agreed, they're, they're still gonna get it done, um, but it'll just be a little bit more like a regular job where people expect to be paid um, for what they do and the amount of time that they put in, um, so yeah. Rob, I, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, just, just one or two more. Uh, the first being, uh, where should, well, well one, I, I know there's a lot of people who aren't involved maybe in the industry or in the entertainment industry, writers, actors who just love movies. They love TV. They want to, they want to see it get made. They're, they're, they're tired of seeing their favorite things get pushed back and, and, and they want to see, you know, the people who make the things they love, you know, get a, get a fair shake. Where are some good, reliable places that if people have, an, have a few extra bucks to spare, I've seen entertainmentcommunity.org. I don't know if there's something more specific for the writers as well. Where are a couple of good, reliable places that if people um, have, a, have a dollar to spare to, to help out you, know, you guys while you're on, on strike and fighting the good fight? Yeah, you know, there, there's a couple of methods. One, the Entertainment Community Fund does, uh, it, it helps writers, but it also helps all entertainment workers. And I think that is really important because, um, you know, this is this is the writer's strike uh, and, and the actor's strike. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, other people, it's always important for us to remember that other people are affected by it and their jobs. Um, and, you know, our belief is that, you know, if we win this fight and we get a fair contract, it's by, by virtue of what they call pattern bargaining, it's going to help these other people who are out of work when their turn to negotiate comes up next year. So I do think like the entertainment community fund is a great place to look into uh, donating money. Um, there's also, you know, for, uh, uh, there's a wonderful writer, uh, Joel Garfinkel, who created the green envelope grocery aid fund, which basically, um, provides $100 grants to writers, I believe in support staff uh, as well, um, who apply into it for groceries. Um, and uh, I actually saw her last night and this is an insane number. She launched this, you know, into the strike, obviously it didn't predate the strike mm -hmm. and they've raised uh, something like $175,000 to help people with groceries, you know, um, and, you know, we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, shelter and food are pretty important. So um, uh, the work that she's done uh, with that, uh, it, it is a great place to put money because it literally puts food in the mouths of striking writers and striking support staff. Um, there's also, I believe you can donate to um, a, a group called Humanitas. Um, that also, I, I believe their grant is a little more writer and actor now that the actors are on strike, a little more tailored to the actual striking workers. Um, so yeah, th those are those are three big ones. But really, the Entertainment Community Fund um, and uh, that Green Envelope Grocery Aid, which is uh, a reference to residual checks, um, because 
the the residual checks, which is one of the reasons that the writers are on strike, because um, in streaming uh, they have gotten minuscule for the amount of eyeballs and hours of viewing that, say, a show from 10 years ago, like Suits on Netflix, sure. uh, uh, got, and the writers are seeing bupkis. So uh, the Writers Guild does this great thing, and you know they have this kind of light green envelope that all the residual checks come in, and, and you're just so happy when you open the mailbox, even if it's just a cup of coffee. But still, like obviously, it would be great if uh, a company is making lots and lots of money off of your work uh, to be able to share in that. Last thing for you, Rob. I, I think now more than ever, there is so much information, especially if you're only a casual viewer. You scroll and, and, and who knows what you, you might see, whether you're well-intentioned or not. If you are interested in, in what is going on in the writers and actors, you know, strikes and, and trying to stay up to date, I know there's a lot of misinformation out there. I know, you know, I, I've seen you've made some TikToks about the studios, um, you know, putting out some less than reliable information or some very twisted and you know versions of the of of the story that's that's playing out right now. We're a couple of maybe reliable places that that people could go to um, to get an honest view of of what's happening. Yeah, you know, uh, social media is hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. you know, you know, I'll, I'll say a hashtag, uh, WGA strike or hashtag WGA strong. And within that, probably the top comments that you find on Twitter, cause I'm not calling, calling it the other thing. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the top comments on that are going to be probably like, well retweeted, uh, reliable pieces of information. Um, it is it is one of the hardest things in this because social media didn't exist in our last strike in, mm. in the way that it, it does now. Um, Twitter did not exist. And it's been a useful tool to combat that propaganda uh, and that kind of misinformation. And it was it's fascinating to see it in real time. You know, and a, a day before our recording, an article came out and I was in the middle of a captain's meeting with some of our negotiating committee. This has all come out in the press, but... Uh, this article published while we were all meeting and they debunked it in real time. And you just saw every writer in that room, pick up their phones and combat it on Twitter. Um, so uh, I think, I think that having the presence on social media through those hashtags um, and finding good information through those hashtags, as opposed to just reading the industry trades, Variety, mm -hmm. Hollywood Reporter, Deadline, because uh, they're all owned by the same company. Um, and uh, that company uh, takes a lot of advertising money from the studios. So sometimes uh, there are there are great reporters who, who work at those companies, uh, but sometimes you have to, you know, call them out. Um, so so, yeah, it's uh, it's been an incredible tool and I think is part of why the writers have been winning the war for public opinion, because unlike 15 years ago in the last strike, um, we're able to immediately jump on untruths and call them out. And honestly, like every time one of those pieces of propaganda comes out, I see more people at the picket line because it pisses them off. So, As it should. so I guess keep the propaganda coming because it keeps us picketing because you know, uh, we all want to be done picketing because we want a fair deal, not because you lied out your ass. Rob, I don't want to take any more more time from you, but I, I appreciate this. Um, this is fantastic. Uh, I'll be sure to leave all, all the links to all the different places that Rob mentioned um, for information as far as the hashtags um, to donate. Um, if you are able to, Rob, rooting for you. Um, appreciate that every everything the uh, the writers uh, do, both when they're making their content and uh, and right now, just you know, yeah. and fight for a fair deal. Thank you for having me on, and thank you for being engaged and you know getting the word out about the strike and the ongoing nature of it. And um, to you know people who are not as ensconced in the Hollywood worker bubble, but people who are just fans of what we do. Because at the end of the day, that's that's all we want. We want to keep making great, meaningful, funny, dramatic, ridiculous stuff.
the more ridiculous, the better. The Rob, ridiculous, I hope to see you uh, making something very ridiculous, hopefully, uh, hopefully in the near future. Rob Foreman, uh, thank you very much. This has been That Movie Is Ours Now podcast, uh, another episode in the books. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, David.